And welcome to the Rob Call Bottom Up show. Uh, we've just recently begun to do it on video and audio, so you can catch it on uh, video at YouTube or at opednews.com. Uh, and you can catch it on audio at iTunes and Progressive Radio Network. Uh, my guest tonight is Marianne Williamson. Uh, she's an American spiritual teacher, author, and lecturer. She's published 11 books, including four New York, New York Times number one bestsellers. She's the co-founder of the Peace Alliance, a grassroots campaign supporting legislation to establish the United States Department of Peace. The New York Times called her a self-help guru. The quote from her book, A Return to Love, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure, often attributed to Nelson Mandela is one of the most oft-quoted passages of our time. While I've known of Marianne for a long time and even called into her talk show maybe 12 or 13 years ago, I just met her face-to-face -face this past weekend at the Sister Giant Conference she co-organized in Washington, D.C., where speakers included Bernie Sanders, Dennis Kucinich, Cenk Iger, Tom Hartman, Rabbi Michael Lerner, Gene Houston, Jeffrey Teachout, Ari Berman, Pramila Jayapal, and Robert Thurman. Uh, the Sister Giant website is sistergiant.com. The, tw the Twitter hashtag, where there's a lot of good information, is hashtag Sister Giant. Uh, Marianne's website is marianne.com, M A R I A N N E.com. Uh, last, Marianne gives a talk in New York City every Tuesday. It's streamed live, and there are a lot of people who show up live. Uh, and I, I was checking it out today. And uh, between the live people and the people who checked it, the stream, over 10,000 people uh, w w watched it. Uh, it's pretty amazing. So great to have you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Can you start off by telling us about Sister Giant and how people can access the video and your future plans for citizen events? <clears throat> yes, I think the energy was very high, as you know. Absolutely. And, wonderful. And in a way that is obviously part of a national, in many ways, international tide of resistance to what does feel like a dangerous um, trajectory that we are on uh, because of the Trump administration. Um, I want to continue that momentum in terms of our little piece of it. You know, nobody has a monopoly on, on a revolution, right? You have your part, I have my part, it's an all hands on deck type of moment. But I hope for the sister giant um, experience, what people went through at the conference, I think there was a lot of desire to keep things moving. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it in five cities. We haven't totally and completely decided which five yet, but five cities of what I call spirit of citizenship rallies. And in those five cities, there will, it will be a one day rather than a two and a half day. During the day, it will be kind of like a little mini sister giant. And then the evening will be a workshop on political activism, specifically related to the 2018 uh, races, not only locally, county, state, and federal. I'm as concerned as I'm sure you are about this assault on the state houses as much as on our federal Congress and government. I think if I take a city, like for instance, I'm choosing Minneapolis as one of them, I think, and so then the hope is that people from Indiana, people from Chicago, you know, that we can sort of divide the country into five sections and hopefully serve that way. So that's where my attention is right now to really help create the pipeline that moves people into actual running or at least being very involved with supporting actual campaigns. As you know, Jan Huger from the Young Turks was at Sister Giant. And he has the Justice Democrats that he's talking about. But that's for people who are ready to run, you know, for federal office, for U.S. Congress. Not, a lot of people, you know, they're not ready for that, but they're ready to enter the pipeline. They're ready to enter the, the activist system in relation to electoral politics. Because I think, and I'm, I'm sure you would agree, that with 2018, we must be involved electorally because that's where they've 
taken over levels, levers of power that we must seek to, um, that's a situation we need to change. So that's what I'm, I'm working on now is preparing for these uh, citizenship rallies. But tell us about Sister Giant. Uh, this was the third or fourth year that you did it, I think. And, uh, no, it's not the third or fourth year, but it's the third or fourth conference. I've done them like the last one I did was 2015. You know, it's not a nonprofit. It's just what I, you know, it's like a, just a, a conference I like to host and produce. So Glad you do. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So I've just done it when I felt impassioned about doing it. It began as something that definitely had to do with women. You know, when the first one happened, when was that in 2009? 2010. The first one ha did have to do with women and activism. And I think to, by 2000, by the third one, you know, Bernie Sanders was already the keynote. This, this is a moment of such all hands on deck that I, we can't, we can't tarry around questions like who's a man, who's a woman, who's gay, who's straight, who's black, who's white, who's older, who's younger. You know, this is, this is an American cry of the heart and then an American challenge. So even though it's called Sister Giant, and even though it began as a, as a women's conference, you know, Mother Jones Magazine has mother, and you know, none of us think it's only for women to read, right? So it is, at this point, what all of us are doing, seeking to, in whatever way we can, um, answer the call that I think is going out to this generation of Americans. Just no differently than it went out to uh, the generation that fought World War II, except that I, wanna, I don't want to say the enemy is within, but the challenge is within. The invasion is within. What do you mean it's within? Pardon? What do you mean? What do you mean it's within? Domestically. I think we're going through right now. I don't think it's a hyperbole to say we are facing right now an assault by crypto fascist forces. I don't think that that's, that's an overstatement. I don't think that Trump is simply as bad as we feared. I think he's worse than we feared. I agree. You know, this much power at his command, the worst aspects of his psyche and of his character, able to just rule by edict. And I remember how they got on Obama for the executive orders. My Lord, he just keeps doing them like he thinks he's a dictator. He, he treats Congress like it's irrelevant. He is seeking to delegitimize uh, not only intelligence agencies, not only the press, but even the judiciary. You know, when he was, um, when, when, he, when he was talking about a so-called judge, this, this could be a threat to people's lives. When you take all the, all the incredible political power and force that he has accumulated, and this has been a concern for many of us from the beginning, not that he would do something genuinely wicked, although all of this, but that somebody else might right. think that that's the, the dog whistle because it is the dog whistle. So it's like we're watching a, a car crash in slow motion. And I think all of us want to do what we can to deal with it effectively. Now, one thing that really uh, affected me. Excuse about... me. Just a moment. I'm so sorry. Somebody's talking and I can't hear you. I apologize, Rob. I'm no so problem. No problem. This is a new, new, new technology home home TV <laughs> interviews. So, uh, one thing you know that really got me about your conference, Sister Giant. Uh, was that you, you took a different approach to looking at Trump supporters. And I would really like you to get into how you look at them and how you encourage people to look at them. Well, we're not a monolithic country. And I don't think that Trump supporters are a monolithic electorate. And I have met some Trump supporters who are very lovely people. And I have a couple of very close girlfriends who voted for Trump, who I know for a fact are very lovely people. Um, and I think a lot of people thought no matter what, um, they were gonna go with the Republican or 
uh, no matter what, uh, a lot of people seemed to think he was going to change. I don't know where people got that because we were always told he will pivot during the general or, you know, this idea that he would pivot, whatever. And I think Obama had actually said that whoever you are before you're president, the presidency only magnifies who you are, and we're certainly seeing that. But it is undeniable that he did harness for political purposes an extremist element of, of the American electorate and worse than extremist, xenophobic, racist, um, white nationalist, even neo-Nazi, anti-Semitic, some very, some of the most base instincts in the American psyche. And we had, we thought, created a society, not where any of us were naive enough to know that those voices and those attitudes did not exist here. But we thought we had come to a point where we had a mainstream social agreement that such voices were so extreme, so on the fringe, that they had no place within the public sphere in terms of mainstream political conversation. We thought we had arrived at that place. I remember years ago when David Duke tried to run for something and he didn't get very far. You know, it's like what's happening with Jeff Sessions now. There was a time when this man couldn't even make a federal judgeship. There was a time when nobody of consequence could have taken David Duke seriously. And what happened is that those ramparts fell with this election cycle. First of all, we have, because of the internet, the fact that even the most extremist voices can create for themselves and can exploit platforms and hold megaphones such in a way that they did not have earlier because the, the mainstream media is no longer the gatekeeper that they once were. And you, you couple that with the fact that the mainstream media itself has been so corrupted by corporate uh, ratings uh, uh, bottom line that too often, whether it was Trump or some of his most crazy supporters, they were given the megaphone. They were put on television. And this whole thing was a Frankenstein phenomenon by good people who seemed to think it was, you know, what did Les Moonves said? It, bad for America, but good for ratings. And I, they seemed to think that it was a joke. It was not a joke. And you create this Frankenstein, then they couldn't uncreate it. I think there are some really fine people working within even mainstream media today, but, you know, people finally woke up. But the point is that he did harness these extremist elements for political purposes. I don't think they make up all of his electorate. Perhaps they don't even make up the majority of his electorate. I don't know. We do know that on President Trump's Twitter feed, one third also subscribed to the Twitter feeds of white nationalist sites. We know that this. I didn't know. That's yeah, absolutely that's one. disturbing. So I think that two things. I think well, obviously many things are involved. This was a this was a perfect storm. It's a multidimensional problem, and it's a it's got to be multidimensional, very integrated, holistic uh, solution as well. But one issue, of course, is that we don't need so much to fight who we don't agree with, except in an electoral sense. But on a level of energy, this is not a time when we need to fight who we don't agree with, but we do need to do much, much more to harness the power of the collaborative possibilities available to us when we join with those with whom we do agree. It's like what you and I are doing right now. We, we, you know, somebody said the other day, I think it was that sister giant, but what about the echo chamber? We shouldn't be so afraid of the echo chamber because when you have a field, when you have a conversation that is repeated and that becomes honed and you give up, you give a piece of it. And then I learn from that and I give a piece of it and you learn from that. So that theoretically this radio show being an example, I learn from you, you learn from me then maybe your conversation is a little more honed, my conversation will be a little more honed because of what we learn from each other. And then this becomes a very resonant field. In A Course in Miracles, it says, an idea grows stronger when it is shared. And I think, obviously, the left was so fractured in this election. I was a Bernie supporter who immediately pivoted to Hillary, but there were the Hillary people, there were the Bernie people, there were the Bernie people who wouldn't pivot to Hillary, then there were the Jill Stein supporters. I mean, the whole thing, you know, we all know what happened. But I, I hope that with the 2018 elections, enough of us will show up 
And then there were added to what I just said, those people who didn't even vote, that's some kind of what, principled show of conscience. <laughs> Fine, great, right? So I- No, 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 no. <laughs> my hope is that now, once again, don't even worry too much about the people you don't agree with, except in, in terms of pure political activism, you know, and, and electoral politics. Absolutely, we must concern ourselves. But in terms of really going forward, we need to just be much, much stronger in our capacity to harness the energies of those who basically agree. And you know, it's been said for a long time, the left is a circular firing squad. The left has got to stop, you know. Uh, it, it's just absurd, the, the craziness and the criticism you get from people with whom you basically agree, but you didn't just say it just right. You didn't do exactly what they wanted you to do. We need to ourselves be more of a big tent. We, the left prides itself because it's a big tent demographically, ethnically, culturally, but we're not a big tent attitudinally. And we need to become that if we are to be serious about interrupting the trajectory that is unfortunately now upon us. Well, I, I came out of your, the, the Sister Giant Conference and I, I wrote an article called the saying that the Democratic Party needs to go through a truth and reconciliation, just like South Africa did. Because frankly, in my opinion, the Democratic Party had a very bad influence mm -hmm. on the... the uh, How about now? Okay. I didn't hear the last few things you said. Because okay, yeah. I, okay. I got you came out of the conference. I came out of the conference feel, uh, and I wrote an article saying that the Democratic Party needs to go through a truth and reconciliation, just like South Africa. Uh, because I believe that the, the, the leadership of the Democratic Party did some really wrong things with Bernie Sanders, with the DNC and Debbie Wasserman Schultz and their collaboration with the mainstream media. And uh, there are a lot of people angry and, and it, it ended up giving us a candidate who was so flawed and disliked that a lot of people, maybe those two thirds of the Trump voters who are not tied to white nationalists or whatever, who, who repudiated Hillary and the Democratic Party because of the, the actions of the Democratic Party. So I, I think that it's, it's really important that that has that kind of confession has to happen and the, and the other side of it and this is what i got also from your, the conference is that we've got to uh, it, it forgive and embrace the trump supporters who didn't vote specifically for trump i think an awful lot of them voted against hillary and uh, against uh, the corporate democrats i mean there were two populist candidates running uh bernie and trump bernie was cut out and i think that a lot of americans went for the only populist option that, as a way to support being opposed to the TPP and things like that. So what you said that really got to me was, uh, you talked about atonement and forgiveness uh, uh, towards the Trump supporters. So can you talk a little bit about that? Well, there are two conversations here, the atonement and forgiveness um, and amends that I think the country needs to make right now has to do with Native Americans and African Americans far more than between the Democrats and the Repub uh, okay. Democrats and their supporters. However, I do totally agree with you in your analysis of what happened. I can't tell you how many people I met in my travels who said they would not vote for Hillary, but would vote for, that they would vote for Trump over Hillary, but they would vote for Bernie over Trump. I think Bernie would have trounced Trump. I think that this was not going to be an establishment year, no matter what, there was going to be a populist revolution. It was either going to be a progressive populism or it was going to be uh, an authoritarian populism and we know what occurred, or at least we think we know what occurred. Who really knows what occurred, right? Hello. And I believe that the corporate, the corporate democratic establishment absolutely, absolutely bears tremendous responsibility for what occurred here, not only because of their treatment of Bernie, which you mentioned, but also it's important for us to realize, I think, that the same thing that happened between the establishment Democrats and Bernie happened in congressional and senatorial races all over the country. Absolutely. I was doing an online progressive summit uh, during that election season, and there were so many fantastic primary candidates, so many fantastic primary candidates, congressional and senatorial, who were just smashed by the corporatists who came in. And look what they did to Alan Grayson, uh, mauled him, 
one of the great, uh, I think one of the great progressive voices. So I, I don't know so much about a truth and reconciliation, but I think it's important for us to remember they lost and they lost big. Just stroll on in now, guys. This is where I think Cenk Ugar uh, is really onto something with the Justice Democrats. Uh, at this point, we just need to uh, go forward. You know, when, when, when um, Abraham Lincoln said, with malice towards none, with charity for all, malice towards charity for all, malice towards none, he was talking about how the South would be treated. They would not be treated as a vanquished enemy, but as brothers who had come home. And I, we don't have time right now to have anything other than, than mercy and forgiveness towards each other. And I think a lot in terms of the corporate Democrats, I think, I, I don't think any of them are under the impression that, they, that it all went well for them. And at this point, I think it's a matter of our standing up and our standing up en masse. And, it, you know, look, if we get pushback from the likes of, of uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, that's another story. But I'm not sure at this point so much that we would. I mean, look what's going on now in the, in the race between Keith Ellison and others who are running for head of the DNC. It's going to be very interesting to see what, what goes on. I do think, um, you know, every day the news changes. And that's why I was mentioning even at Sister Giant, mentioning at my lecture last night, don't just make calls to your congresspeople and senators who are voting in ways you do not like. Make calls also to your congressmen and senators who are doing what you want, but tell them to go further, tell them to go further, tell them to go further. If this man continues the way he is now, pretty soon, the, the only reasonable, the only reasonable path will be impeachment. I agree. And, and I, I, it's just unbelievable to me the way clearly the Republicans, they, their, their view is we cannot have one break. We cannot have one crack. And of course, it was two women. Isn't that interesting? It was two women, Susan Collins and the lady from the senator from Alaska, who voted against Betsy DeVos. But at some point, if this continues the way it is, um, I believe the cry for impeachment will begin to be heard. Yes, I keep thinking we're going to be talking about President Pence pretty soon. Uh, and that'll get rid of uh, President so, uh, Trump and Bannon which is pretty scary. You know, you mentioned A Course in Miracles, and uh, that's a, a lot of what you've been involved with over the years. Uh, can you talk a bit about A Course in Miracles, how that ties in with what you do and the way you, you think and what you teach? Well, I've had a career for over 30 years uh, uh, as a, someone who speaks and writes about a set of books called A Course in Miracles. The Course in Miracles is not a religion. There's no dogma, no doctrine. It's based on universal spiritual themes. And it is a, it is a psychological mind training on the relinquishment of a thought system based on fear and the acceptance instead of a thought system based on love. And basically, its message is that when your thoughts and behaviors stray from love, you will call forth effects that are chaotic and, and, and fearful. And this applies to a collective as much as to an individual. The United States has not stood for mercy and stood for justice and stood for humanitarian values and stood for brotherhood, stood for peace in all the ways that we as a nation theoretically purport to and that I believe the vast majority of Americans would like to see. Over the last few decades, beginning with the issue of economic justice, so many of the resources of our country materially have been siphoned off into the hands of a very few Americans, creating so much despair. The, the difficulty people have getting higher education, the difficulties people have getting health care, the difficulties people have just getting into the game. And then, of course, our behavior internationally, which has been nothing short of imperialistic and abusive in quite a few cases. So from a spiritual perspective, what we have now is a, is a situation that we brought on ourselves because we ourselves as a nation have strayed from the tenets of mercy and compassion and justice that, that are at the core of, of the heart of any human being on the planet and what every nation should embody. So whether you're talking about abolition, which emerged from the Quakers, or the fact that Alice Paul and other leaders of the suffragette movement were Quakers, or the fact that Dr. King was a preacher in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. It's not an accident that the great social justice movements in the history of our country have emerged from a spiritual foundation. 
because a spiritual path gives you conviction. A spiritual path, you know, I, I talked at this weekend about the difference between being anti-slavery and being an abolitionist. And that psychological transition from, oh, I think it's terrible to it will not happen on my watch. This is the kind of shift we have to make now. And that's the kind of shift that spirituality um, inspires in us when we take these issues and these principles of justice, of love, of mercy, of brotherhood, and don't just see them as nice things to talk about or think about, but as foundations on which we, uh, on which we stand in our daily lives. It's, it's a commitment not just to your own self-interest, but to God as you understand him. So how would you apply your, your long time depth of experience with the Course in Miracles to activism and politics? Well, love is not a passive emotion. Love is participatory. <clears throat> if, if I give my life to love today, then I cannot ignore the sufferer who is next to me. There is no serious religious or spiritual path that gives anyone a pass on addressing the suffering of other sentient beings. Mass incarceration is more than economically unsound. It is immoral. It is evil. It, it, it is actually taking advantage, turning human suffering into a profit center. This is a moral issue. This is not just a political issue. This is a moral issue. This is a spiritual issue. This is an issue of right and wrong. Too often people on the left are so, we act like we're too cool to get into moral issues, like everything is morally relative. Not everything is moral relative is morally relative. Some things are right and some things are wrong. And, and traditionally, the conservative side of the political spectrum in the United States has focused on uh, issues of private morality, which they continue to do. But traditionally, the left focused on issues of public morality. Economic justice is a moral issue. The fact that you, you give all your money to the rich and make it so and squeeze 99% of the rest of the population, this is a moral issue. Mass incarceration is a moral issue. Invading countries that didn't do anything to you is a moral issue. So I, I think for, for those of us who come at it uh, from a spiritual perspective, politics is just a word. But the collective behavior of, of our nation, where we're dwelling within ourselves, who we are as a nation and how we behave, that is primarily a spiritual issue. And the fact that it has political uh, consequences and effects is, is, is true and it's important. And we, we want to deal with that. But the base of our inspiration and motivation has to do with the human heart. Now, at Sister Giant, you asked people to say if, whether this was the first time they were, it, it, that they were interested in politics. Uh, most of the people who showed up are people who, who, who watch you, listen to your message, which is more of a spiritual message, uh, I believe. Is that, is, an, is that accurate? Yes. See, when, I, when my career began, first of all, I grew up in a political home. So, you know, not a, a, a electorally political, but my father was like a cross between William Kunstler and Zorba the Greek. You know, he took me, when I was a little girl, my father took me to Saigon to show me what war was. So I, I grew you up. You talked about that. that was a, tell that with story. Would you? That's an amazing story. It is an amazing story. My father was an amazing person. So I, I grew up with politics as part of the conversation at dinner every night, you know, and I, so I grew up in that milieu. But when I began my career, not long after I started lecturing on A Course in Miracles, the AIDS crisis exploded. Uh, and I was living in Los Angeles at that time, working in New York quite a bit. So in my career, as a person who wrote and spoke about spirituality, the issue of profound human suffering and our spiritual call to address that was, was the two were never separate. And also, I grew up in a generation where you read Ram Das and the I Ching in the morning and you went to anti-war rallies in the afternoon. So for me, the two were never separate. However, what happened in this particular field of new thought over the last few decades is that it went in a very a political direction, the New Thought churches and so forth, um, in a way that I never could relate to. And my career has unfolded in a kind of funny way where so many of my spiritual audience are like, oh, love Marianne, but I just can't stand it when she talks about politics. But similarly, a lot of people who know me 
is a political activist and like, well, I really like Marianne, but I just wish she wouldn't talk about God so much. To me, as with Martin Luther King, as with Gandhi talking about how politics should be sacred, the two greatest political lights of the 20th century were based, their movements were based in the spiritual principles of nonviolence. So to me, the integration of the two is not only comfortable for me intellectually, but to me, it is necessary if we are to have the kind of effect and effectiveness that we wish. I remind you, for instance, and when it comes to pure materially based political activism right now, the Republicans have it sewn up. They have the House, they have the Senate, and they have the White House. Like, who are we kidding? Do you think just traditional activism is enough to handle this? No, we, we could use some, some help from an expanded place in consciousness. And, and those of us who have ever been too afraid or uh, too embarrassed to mention it, uh, perhaps should be a little less uh, apologetic or vast in our statements now. So what do you say to people who are spiritual, who go to church, who, who attend or listen to your, your presentations, who uh, really have not gotten into activism or politics? Well, what I, what I have been saying is come to Sister Giant, and many of them did. You know, Rob, we're living at a time, and you know this, uh, there's a mass awakening going on in the United States right now. People, Americans are often very distracted, very self-involved, asleep to what's happening. And the whole world knows this about us. But the whole world also knows that when we do wake up, we slam it like nobody's business. And right now, there is an awakening going on in America. It took a catastrophe to get us there. But as, as Churchill is famous for saying, you can always count on America to do the right thing after they have exhausted every other option. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think right now it's not a hard sell. And it has been throughout my career because I wrote my book on spirituality and politics was published in 1998. It's an understatement to say it was not my greatest commercial success. But now I think many, not only, not only is it that many people in the spiritual communities are more interested in engaging politically, but I think it's also true that many people who engage politically are also more interested in a more expanded, more enlightened conversation about the different dimensions of, of, of effect of what it takes to make a human being effective in this world. Now, Course in Miracles, the, the, the operant word is miracles. Yes. Talk about miracles. A miracle is a shift in our perception from fear to love. And once you recognize that thought, all thought creates form on some level, and that thought itself is a cause that has an effect, and that what we see in the world is the effect the cause of which is thought, you realize that a shift in perception is a mighty power indeed. That's why Martin Luther King said we need a quantitative shift in our circumstances, but also a qualitative shift in our souls. And without that, you know, Martin Luther King said that the desegregation of the American South was the political externalization of the goal of the civil rights movement but that the ultimate goal is the establishment of the beloved community. Well, let's look at why he said that and how prescient he was when he said that. If you only change things on the level of effect, things can be changed. So they got the Voting Rights Act. Well, we're living at a time now, the Supreme Court has already started chipping away at it. We have voter suppression rearing its ugly head once more. It was over 800 voting places were actually dismantled in this last election. So until we actually reach a place in consciousness, you know, where these things are considered untenable, the struggle will not be over. You know, you, you, you can write an Emancipation Proclamation, you can abolish slavery, you can write the 13th Amendment. As important as these things are, they were and are external remedies. Other generations abolish slavery, we must abolish racism itself. So that's the deal. If you look at it that way, it's not enough to just have laws uh, of, of, of racial justice, which we absolutely, this is not an either or, it's a both and. But we must also do the work at abolishing racism itself. And that's why when you were talking about atonement and apology, and you probably saw it the first night at Sister Giant, we, we do a ritualized apology to, to African Americans. So our generation is called to address both the internal and the external dimensions of change. 
for that matter, this catastrophe, and I think it is a catastrophe actually that we are experiencing right now, came about because of very internal issues. Internal issues like hate, internal issues like fear, internal issues like xenophobia, misogyny, racism, and so forth, but also the one that really opened the door and let this happen was the internal issue of disengagement. We uh, opened the door, we opened the windows and let this thief in. If it hadn't been him, it would have been someone else. And that's because far too many of us have been disengaged from the political process. But look, they, they're not even teaching, they're not even teaching civics in school anymore. They're not even teaching history. And now that Betsy, did, let's not kid ourselves. Now that Betsy DeVos is Secretary of Education, I feel that the whole, the whole um, assault there on public education has to do not only with charter schools, which of themselves I don't have a problem with, but really building and, 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 and supporting a network of, of, of education that will include a level of right-wing indoctrination that is terrifying. Which the Koch brothers have already been doing extensively at the college level, giving millions of dollars to scores of different colleges to uh, fund programs and courses and approaches. Yeah, but this is even worse than that, isn't it? Because they want to get them while they're children. Yeah. So, but I, w I want to stay with miracles a little bit longer because I have a feeling that you will see some miracles already happening. I do see miracles already happening. You know, like I was saying before, I mean, don't you? There is an awakening going on. And I, I when people ask me, what is your goal for Sister Giant? I said my goal was that people would leave their lid up. And it worked really well. They were. And, I, and, I, and now we will do the rallies. There's the yin and the yang. There's the internal and the external. First, we had to do the internal. And that's what Sister John at the conference was. Really connecting some dots so that people's energy is free. And now, now we go to the doing. You know, there's the being and the doing. And in anything in life, if the level of our being is as important as the level of our doing, if your being isn't clear, then your doing will not be as effective as it might be. But if you only concentrate on being and not on doing, then it, it, can, it, it, it can devolve into navel gazing and narcissism and all those well, You brought up narcissism. Um, I, I've done a lot of interviews looking at psychopathy <laughs> and sociopathy and narcissism. Why don't you talk about your thoughts on that and Trump a bit? Well, people have already said and written very powerful essays. I've read them. Most of us have read them by now. Um, I think it's um, inaccurate to posit the belief or the opinion that we're dealing here with a malignant narcissist. What we have to deal with is not you know, you can't, you don't prove these are, you know, it's not like diabetes, not a blood test. The point is for us to get out of our naivete, which, which might lead us to believe that the president of the United States being a malignant narcissist will not have political consequences. That's where we have to go now. Not just whether or not we think he's a malignant narcissist, because at a certain point behavior, you know, walks like a duck, talks like a duck. The issue now is for us to realize that the lives of millions of people can be affected by this, and thousands already have been affected. I mean, the suffering of this Muslim ban, and, and the suffering, I, I, this is human suffering that we're talking about. Always, you know, take it home, take it home. These are human beings suffering that we're talking about. Look what happened in Yemen. I, it, there are just so many ways that, that that whether you know you call it a malignant narcissist or whatever i think for political purposes the phrase we should be concentrating on has to do with the 25th amendment it's called mentally unfit for office and that that's where my mind is i think that he is mentally unfit for office and what that means is that his behavior is actually dangerous i would and agree you look at, at what he has done already in what three weeks and he hasn't even started in on, really, on China, <laughs> North Korea, Iran. Oh, he has started. He's, he's already yeah, uh, he put Iran pissed on. them off. <laughs> yeah, but they all know what a fool he is. They do. And what an embarrassment. So another thing you talk about a lot is God and our relationship with God. <laughs> Where does that fit in? 
uh, Declaration of Independence says, all men are created equal and endowed by a divine creator with the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I mean, it's, it, the Americans, it, this is something the left sometimes leaves out. We are a religious nation. Hello, progressives. Hello. You're having this, I mean, the, 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 the human psyche is hardwired for connection to that which is higher. And if you, and this, you go back throughout history. I mean, all the way back, you see cave drawings that prove this to be true, ancient societies and so forth. If you don't give people the real deal, they will go with the ersatz version. Same with patriotism. We're hardwired for connection to tribe. That's another place where the left is acting like we're too cool for that. Great, guys, great. How's that working out for you? You don't give people the real thing, they will go with the ersatz version. We're too cool to talk about morality. Great, you don't want to talk about the immorality of economic injustice and so forth, mass incarceration and so forth, great. You're not gonna talk about it because the other side will appropriate the conversation. If you don't give people the real thing, they will uh, take the ersatz version. You know, I grew up in the, uh, there was a religious left. You had uh, the Berrigan brothers and you had William Sloan Coffin. And in the African-American community, they never have separated left-wing politics from the church. And the separation of church and state is something completely different. Separation of church and state, obviously, is a very enlightened principle. It means no rabbi or priest or mufti or minister is going to tell Congress what law they can or cannot pass. And it means that when I or anyone else are holding a church service or a synagogue service or, or a mosque service or whatever, no governmental official can come in and shut it down. But the founders did not do that to suppress the religious conversation in America. They did it to expand, to liberate, and to protect the religious conversation in America. So it's not like if we come from a spiritual base, basis that somehow we lose our citizenship and aren't supposed to open our mouths. So. Amen. <laughs> you know, the, somebody at Sister Giant talked about how progressives, people on the left, demean people of faith. And I think it was Michael Lerner, and he and I think he's right. There's a uh, there is a I think he's called it a religiophobia, uh, yes. religiophobia. Although once again, not if it's African American, isn't that interesting? They they wouldn't dare. But among uh, um, uh, otherwise, yeah, it's absolutely there. I remember when my book Healing the Soul of America came out, and how how many rolled eyes I got because it was uh, about even though the politics were so progressive um i dare, dare to talk about god <laughs> so one of the ideas that I, that I took away from uh, sister giant was that uh i, I don't go to church on, on the weekend or synagogue i'm jewish I don't, I don't i don't i don't do that uh but uh we need people in the streets we need people out there demonstrating people who are marching every week and maybe we need to start thinking about the streets as the new church and something that we do on a committed regular re, re, quote religious basis is get out on the streets every weekend every saturday every sunday and do something to stand up for justice to stand up for the planet to stand up for for equal rights and for people being treated decently. Um, I, I, w I think that that's a, a kind of a, a narrative or meme that could have some legs. What do you think? Well, I think that we are moving towards a pattern. I hope we're moving towards a pattern, which we saw during the anti-Vietnam War era, which is you didn't just go to one rally, you went, as you were saying, every week. I went to the rally in Washington, D.C. I was here at Battery Park in New York recently. A lot of people are talking about the Fire, Fire the Fool. Have you heard about that one? Fire yeah. the Fool rally that's supposed to be happening on April the 1st. I've been hearing some scuttlebutt about that. And I think it's important that we stop um, invalidating marches. A lot of people say they don't mean anything because they don't have any definite strategy, but that is the strategy. Like you were saying, to march is the strategy. Large groups of people gathered in protest over and over and over again. It's like the Occupy movement. It becomes inconvenient to the system. It is a disruptor. But I also think that there are many other 
other tools that are in our toolkit, uh, having to do with uh, conversations with our elected officials, showing up at town hall meetings, and very, very much uh, gearing up for the 2018 elections, um, both congressional ones and in the states that they have senatorial and state house. Um, I, I, I would see a lot of people, you know, traditionally, Rob, the, the progressives like to show up for the hot and sexy presidential campaign every four years. And conservatives have been much wiser and much more strategic for years now. They show up for everything. They show up for the school board. They show up for city council. They show up for the county commission. They show up for uh, in these state house races and they show up in the midterms. And so these are some of the habits of democracy that I think many of us need to build now. So in the streets it is part of it, but only part of it. And I think that we have to think not just about progressives and, and Republicans. We need to think about progressives and neoliberal Democrats, the Democrats that gave us Donald Trump. And uh, at, at the conference at, at Sister Giant, uh, I spoke to someone who is, is, is a, is a uh, committee member in Kings County, uh, Washington, uh, one of the biggest uh, counties in, in the country. Uh, and she was saying, Bernie, Ma Bernie Sanders said that California and Washington have been taken over by, pro by progressives. The Democratic parties have been taken over by progressives. And what that means is that people have an opportunity to sign up as committee people. The committee people are the ones who elect the state committees that make the decisions on who to endorse. And I was talking to a, a friend who's a local committee person. He was saying how before the election, Hundreds of committee seats were empty. That means if anybody ran, they would get it. And now all of a sudden they're starting to fill up and they're starting to fill up with progressives. So there's a really a good opportunity now to, to, to do a small step in terms of getting elected, getting elected as a committee person to take back the Democratic Party from the for progressives. And uh, I started a Facebook group, Take Back the Democratic Party in America. Uh, and uh, I think that's really an important thing that we need to do. We, we, we've got a system right now where the establishment Democratic Party is just out of control and their interests are with corporations and big money and that has to stop. Uh, thoughts? Well, they just had a big loss. So this is an opportune moment. And what you're talking about with your group is very similar to what Jack Ugar is talking about, the Young Turks and Justice Democrats. So definitely that's that push. And what I was saying earlier about the online summit, in the online progressive summit that I did, only I, I interviewed a lot of progressives who were running on the, on the senatorial and congressional level. The two that made it through the onslaught by the, by the corporatists in the primary season then went on to win their races. And that was Jamie Raskin in Maryland and Pramila Jayapal in Washington State. It's, so it's, it's doable. I'm, I, in putting together this Facebook group, Take Back uh, the Democratic Party for an America, I've had a lot of people saying, screw the Democrats. I've had it with them. I'm disgusted with them. Look what they did to Bernie Sanders. Um, it's, my relationship with them is over. And I keep saying, look at what happened in California. Look at what happened in Washington. In California, there's a congressional seat that's been opened uh, because um, – the, he, the, the congressman was appointed to uh, a, a state position. And uh, the, the, the California Democrats voted 97% for a progressive candidate, which is, which is incredible. And similar things are happening in Washington state. It can happen all over the country, and then things will really change. But we have to, I agree with you, and we have to hurry. We do have to hurry. It's got to happen fast because yeah. we're looking at 2018 and we don't want to... 2018 is very close to now. I mean, it's Absolutely. next year. Yes. So, um, Sister Giant, what, by, what, one more thing I wanted to add uh, in terms of the marches. I think that what's really exciting is the sister marches. Yeah. After when we had the women's march in Washington D.C., there were these sister marches all over the country, and the idea of sister marches that are happening at the same time. Washington D.C. Yeah, do the big one there, but have tens of thousands or scores of thousands of people showing up in Philadelphia and New York and Los Angeles was huge. Yeah, Chicago, huge. I, I mean, that's. A big part of this too is is that you don't have to go to Washington. You can just go locally, 
and play a big role. Not only that, but geography is actually more important at this point than numbers. The fact that a lot of places like Boise, Idaho, you know, that some of these smaller places, some of these places in between the coasts had, you know, you have 5,000 in some of these smaller places that it makes their local newspaper. And that's when you start to really get traction because so many of the newspapers around the country <clears throat> will just roll their eyes at something big happening in New York or Washington or Los Angeles. Exactly. It's yes. when they see them in their own town and when their congressmen see them in their own town. So it's really important that people in, in uh, red states and purple states not think, oh, but we're not New York, we're not LA, we're not Washington, man, you know, wherever you are. You might be in a place where you're going to get 1,500, but in that town, 1,500 would make a difference. So wherever we are, uh, marching is important. And that's what gave the Women's March such incredible power. We know that, right? The picture of the people in Antarctica. Yeah, that was a great picture. So you refer to a collaborative matrix by which we serve the whole. Now, I call my show the Bottom Up Radio Show. Uh, can you tie in any of your ideas with bottom up and top down? Well, you know, I, I mentioned during the conference that the new paradigm leadership is no longer top down. It's, it's that the leader is holding the space for the brilliance of others. You know, I lived at a, in an era when, you know, I, I was young, but I, I was old enough to get what was happening, whether it was the assassination of John Kennedy, the assassination of Bobby Kennedy, the assassination of, of, of Martin Luther King. If you have a social uh, uh, justice movement that is led only or even primarily by soloists, they can, all they have to do is shoot the soloists. So this needs to be a song. You can't shoot the whole choir. You can't shoot the song. So it's very important that all of us think of ourselves as leaders in this movement. And the, the notion of servant leadership, I think it's, if the way to, for all of us to cultivate real leadership at this time is to see ourselves in, in service to the, to the angels of the better nature of our country, in service to the evolving trajectory of American history, in service to our grandchildren and our grandchildren's grandchildren, in service to democracy and in, in honor of our ancestors. And you place yourself in a very humble place of service and this makes you manifest as a leader. And that's really what the grassroots is. Grassroots movement means that we all take responsibility for our part. It's another way of just saying it's an all hands on deck type of moment. All of us have something we can do. I always say every day do something to annoy him. And at this point we need to do more than annoy him. Do something, at this point each of us must every day do something to interrupt the trajectory of what can otherwise become and we should not get ourselves basically a fascist, crypto fascist takeover of the US government. Absolutely, yeah. It's, uh, I, I was looking, I, I put my book around here somewhere. What did I do with it? Uh, I guess I can't find it. Um, to me, the book that most represents what's happening is not 1984. Uh, it's, it's Sinclair Lewis's book, It Can't Happen Here. Uh, that was a book written. I read that so many years ago, and you, I'm, I need to take that out again. Yeah. Well, basically, he talks about a president who just starts banning intellectuals, taking over the universities, taking over the media. Uh, it's a it's a book that you really need to take a look at. Oh, here it is. This is this is the book here. It can't happen here. This is a first edition copy of it I found. Uh, but uh, yeah, check it out. It is terrifying, and and it is seeming more real than I could have ever imagined. I don't think anybody expected this much bad to happen this fast. Well, uh, you know, maybe that's the miracle too. <laughs> that, yeah. that because oh, it's happening I, so yeah. fast, people. I, I, Yes, I really think you're right. I think they've been very stupid uh, to do this because if they were taking a more incremental approach, it would, it would be far more successful for them and far more difficult for us because people accommodate as you go along. The way it is, there's so much happening so fast, so crazy that the whole country is feeling bitch slapped. It's like, what just, you know, the whole country, like, whoa, what just happened? And that's, that's, that's good news in terms of the awakening potential. Hopefully. And what I'm afraid of is that for every public executive edict that he issues, there are a couple of secret ones that we don't know about. And I'm guessing that's probably oh, really happening. Okay, <laughs> well, let's wrap this up. Uh, it's been a great interview. Thank you so much. Uh, what, what do you have to say to, to, to close out to, to people who are wanting to make a difference, uh, wanting to do something? You've said a lot, just to wrap it up. Uh, for me, it is very 
um, empowering to remember that I am one of millions of people who are feeling this way and taking action. And I, I believe, and, and, and history proves, and science proves, when you have enough people, you know, it doesn't take a majority to change a system. It takes that critical mass. You know, this argument, is it 11%, is it 3.4%, whatever it is. The majority didn't say, let's free the slaves. The majority didn't say, let's give women the right to vote. The majority is not as important as we sometimes think, but when you have a small resonant field of committed people, that's what moves history. And I think for all of us to remember, we're, none of us are alone in this. None of us are alone. You know, there are people as we speak, and, you know, and I think that there are people that we don't know about too. There are people in working in all the agencies, working in media, working in, 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 in justice, in legal departments, in, in, in political activism, and also just individual citizens writing to their congresspeople, writing to their senators, showing up at marches, learning how they might be active in 2018. That's not, you know, it's sometimes you only see what's, what's above the waterline, and it's so easy for us to see the quantifiable uh, uh, reflections of the, the power now wielded by people with whom we do not agree. But there are a lot of ways in which power is also being wield, wielded by people with whom we do agree. And on any given day, let's just make sure we're part of that. And I think for me, it's palpable. And for any of us that, that sometimes wonder, then, then let us make sure that we remind each other and support each other and that collaborative venture. It's why you're doing your show. It's why I did your show. It's why you came to Sister Giant. It's why I produced Sister Giant. And you and I are among millions of people doing what we can every day. We're going to pull this off. We this are. Is, and, I, and I, you know, Pamela said it and Bernie said it. This is temporary. I don't think any of us should be so naive as to think it's going to be over in six weeks. And this is going to be a long struggle. But I, and I, I ho hopefully not too long, we will get through this. And it, it is my, not just my hope, it is my absolute conviction. On the other side of this, whenever that is, this will be a better country for it. Thank you so much. Uh, this is, I'm Rob Call. This is the Rob Call Bottom Up Show. You can find it at opednews.com slash podcast. You can look for my name, Rob Call, at K-A-L-L -L, on iTunes. We're on Progressive Radio Network. Marianne Williamson, her website is Marianne, M-A-R-R-I-A-N-N-E. No, it's just one R. Just one R, one R, sorry. And uh, Sister Giant is sistergiant.com. And uh, thanks again, Marianne. And check out other shows uh, that uh, I've done. Much appreciated. God bless you, sir. Thank you so much.